So, hi, I'm Tom. This is David. We work for Red Hat and we are working on uh, IPC mostly. Um, so, just briefly, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, IPC or Interprocess Communication is the stuff that allows different applications to talk to each other. So, imagine you have your Firefox. Uh, drawing a web page and you have your Wayland showing the thing on the screen, these things need to somehow communicate. Uh, and they use IPC to do that so that they can work together to show your web page on your screen. So in general, uh, use, IPC is the thing that allows you to split big monolithic things apart into smaller components and they will then, that can cooperate and still work together. That's why we don't have one big binary running your, your operating system, but you can split things into separate applications. Um, so currently we are working on Dbus, and as we see at the end of the talk, we are working on a new system called Bus1, but more about that later. Uh, Dbus is um, probably the most common uh, IPC system on the typical Linux distributions that you have today, but if you're using other kinds of Linux, or if you're using Windows or Mac or whatever else, there are other kinds of IPC systems out there, obviously. But we are, mostly, we are focusing on, on Dbus today. Um, yeah, so today we will talk about what is Dbus? Why do people use it? Uh, what are the problems with it uh, that still exists? What are the problems it solves? And how do we want to move things forward? Yes, so Dbus exists, Dbus is used. Um, so the question is, why do we even talk about it? Everybody can just use it and we can move on. Um, the world isn't so easy. It's not like Dbus is used by everyone. Dbus is used commonly, but there are lots of other IPC systems um, with different reasons why people don't use Dbus. Um, I don't want to go into the reasons why they decided to choose something else, but we want to look at the um, problems you can encounter when you use uh, when you uh, uh, write your own IPC system. So generally, um, when you want to have an application that communicates with other applications, and you you have two choices: whether um, you can either pick an IPC system off the shelf, one that is already provided to you, that provides all the uh, common operations, you just use it, or you write it yourself, so you do all the hard work. And on Linux, there are many applications that do it themselves, and most of you know that. If you look at applications like Xorg, if you look at Valand, if you look at WPA Supplicant, all those applications have their own IPC. And even if you take the term IPC a bit wider, um, you have uh, applications that communicate via files on your system, uh, via file systems with the kernel, you have Netlink and other systems. Um, yes, so we can't just say um, let's move Dbus, uh, let's uh, use Dbus and move on, but people might uh, have different reasons why they don't use Dbus, so let's look at why we think you should use Dbus and what problems you might run into if you don't. So the most common problem if you don't use the off-the-shelf off uh, off uh, IPC systems, and in this talk we will only concentrate on Dbus in that regard, but there are others as well. Um, if you don't use the off-the-shelf system, you're often not interested in the IPC itself, you just need it. Um, but if you run into problems, you just want to get rid of them, but really concentrate on your own application. Um, so often, you just do 90%, but you don't do the, the last bit, the final bit, to get rid of all your race conditions or whatever you have in your application. Um, and this can get problematic. So as a first step, we want to look into some of the most common uh, issues you run into if you do your own IPC, things that Dbus uh, fixes for you and other IPC systems fix for you. And I want to just describe uh, some of the problems you might encounter. Um, if you look at an IPC system, uh, most of the time we see something like this. We have an application, um, for instance, uh, a Wayland compositor that's responsible to draw your screen. Um, that one would be in the center, and you have a lot of clients in red here that communica uh, communicate with that daemon. For instance, you might have an application that draws its window, then communicates with Wayland to actually show, display it on the screen. Um, whenever you have communication channels between objects, and you start writing your own communication channels using some kernel primitives, the first one, one very common problem you run into is you want asynchronous I.O. You don't want all your method calls you do, all your messages you do, to be blocking. You just want to send them, um, move on with other work, and then wait for the reply if you need some later on. Um, another thing you want to do is send multiple method calls in parallel, send multiple messages in parallel, and do batched I.O. basically. You don't wait for each response, but just wait for them together. 
A very common solution to this, um, with uh, what most IPC systems offer you, is assigning serial numbers to messages. So you can send a message and you can match a reply you get to the outstanding uh, uh, method call you have. And just looking at other examples and common systems on your, uh, on common applications on your system, they even fail to do th such things. Um, that usually means that you have to do blocking I.O. And it's so easy to, uh, to get things wrong if you don't think about such issues from the beginning. Another aspect, for instance, is uh, identity. Um, Whenever you do IPC, you want to actually address objects. You have dynamic objects that you create, that the other side create, and that you want to communicate with. Um, and you need to be aware that you have to identify objects. If you look, for instance, at the kernel netlink uh, implementation, that tells you about all the routes and all the IP addresses you have on your system. But there's no way um, to identify those with an ID or with a specific name, because the kernel doesn't provide it to you. Um, instead, it only provides you events with data about a route, and you need to actually match those locally and try to figure out which object um, uh, a message is talking about. And this can be quite cumbersome because you can't identify the object a new uh, event uh, talks about, whether it's a new object or a different one, or which object exactly it tries to um, modify. Um, the easiest way, of course, is to provide IDs for your objects and always say, before you send a message, this message is about this object and the other side can see this. And a problem that comes with that as well is lifetime management. So whenever you have an object, you want to know when that object goes away, when a new one comes. And you want to have clear barriers there so you never talk about a wrong object. As an example, again, we have in the kernel, again, netlink or um, uh, device communication that tells you the name of a network interface or that tells you the name of a block device. And just imagine you have a block device um, that gets a name like SDA3, um, and it's just going to uh, remove from your uh, computer and replug a different one. It might get the same ID, but your application might have just been about to send a message that operates on that ID. And it clearly wants to operate on the previous edition because it read some information on the device, but the new device might be something else. So you want clear separation. And one of the common solutions there, of course, is to use unique IDs. So you say you never reuse an ID, in which case, any outstanding requests would just fail. Um, and there are a lot more such issues that you run into if you don't use common IPC systems, but if you uh, do things yourself. Those include access management to make sure that an application or other applications are only allowed to access objects they really should. Or accounting, you must make sure if multiple applications talk to you in parallel, one can't exceed all your resources, but they're distributed fairly, uh, fairly across all the different uh, applications that talk to you. All right, so imagine that you solve all of these problems, uh, or that some IPC system they're using have solved all of the problems we talked about now, but then still get st uh, things can still get complicated. So because this is example we talked about here, imagine you have one IPC system. So there's there's one object that you, oh, there's one one daemon that you're talking to from your four clients talking to one daemon, and this might have solved the problem we're talking about with uh, with access control and with identifiers and with lifetimes and so on. But imagine you have a more complicated system, so you have several servers running, uh, services running on your system at the same time uh, that clients talk to. Um, now what you might want to do is that you want to, so say that this is the thing that manages your, your um, display server, whoops, uh, this is your, uh, all your daemon, and this might be your file server, whatever else it is. Uh, and this might be fine when the problems have been solved individually for the, all of these components, but what happens if they start talking uh, to each other? So suddenly you have clients that speak to both the display manager and the sound daemon, and these things, now you must make sure that all the properties that we have uh, uh, got uh, for one service still works uh, when you start composing them. So you must make sure that if you have uh, access control working uh, with one service, they must, access control must still work if you start combining things. Um, and the most difficult thing is that the new problem that appears when you start mixing things together. And that's the problem of, um, uh, sorry, uh, that's the problem of ordering. So if you have several events on your system, several things happening at the same time, you must make sure that the order is consistent. What do we mean by that? Like what people are used to, what people expect is that you have a causal order. You have cause happening before the effect. 
Uh, that's how the world works, that's what people expect. And if your system works in such a way that that's not true anymore, so you observe the effect of something and then you observe the cause of it, people are going to get confused. And confused developers make bugs. So that's a bad thing. <laughs> so we really, as much as possible, we want things to work in an intuitive way, the way the real world works. Now imagine the picture I've drawn here. Uh, so imagine you have, am I allowed to step closer to this thing? Yeah. Um, uh, if you imagine you have, what was the example I wanted? Yeah, you have this client here, for instance. Uh, say that this thing here is the thing that manages the uh, images of your your cloud thing, container thing. So this is the image. This this thing here sends a method call to that thing, and it tells it I, I want to change the permission of a certain image so that someone someone can start using it. And after it's done that, it tells this guy here, which is the container manager, that now please start using an image from there. So now this gets that message and that connects to this thing to start using the image. And if that happens in that order, all is well. This guy gets the, the right permission set and then this guy calls into it and starts using it. But if you don't get composability right, if you don't get ordering right, there's, uh, you have to make sure that the, uh, if this, uh, the events, these two messages get uh, mixed, sorry, if it's possible that this message here can overtake that message there. So if it's possible that even though I first told this guy to change the permissions, and then I told this guy to start using it, if the order is not uh, guaranteed here, it could happen that this guy starts using the image before this guy receives the message that now has to change the permissions. And this is not something as a developer that you expect. And you'll, when, if you run into it, you will fix it, but most probably this is, you know, you'll get it wrong. Uh, and you will not expect that that's even possible. Uh, so that's one thing we want to make sure is that if this guy sends a message here and then sends something there, then they happen in that order. Uh, this could easily be fixed, by the way. If we say that to this guy, before you send this message to this guy telling him to start using the image, you block and you wait for this guy to return. So you first change the permission, you wait for it to finish, then you tell, now, now it's ready, you can start using the thing. So if you know about the problem, you can do that, it's fine, it's a bit silly to wait for a round trip, but okay, fair enough, you can do that. But uh, it can get more complicated than that. Imagine you don't having t you don't not having two method calls you're sending, but you have an event. So say that this thing on top here is uh, UDEP. Uh, this tells don't do that. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so imagine that this thing on top here is, is UDEP. And it's telling your system that a new network device appeared. Uh, and here you have your GUI client, say. Uh, over here you have Network Manager. So uh, UDEP tells you now you have, a new, uh, you have a new network device. And it's going to tell this to this, this GUI client, and it's going to tell it to Network Manager. So Network Manager starts getting ready to, to manage the thing. The GUI client shows it to the user, and now you can start using it. And uh, now imagine that, OK, this the GUI client deci his, it's decided that it's going to start using the, the network device. So it will immediately call into um, Network Manager to start doing its job. So you have one event from UDEV to two different things, uh, and then one of them will speak to the other one. And now, again, if it gets it wrong, if uh, this message is uh, received by Network Manager before Network Manager gets the message that the network device is, is ready, it gets confused. Right? And in this case, it's no longer possible for you, Dev, to block on first sending it here and then send the other one, or the other way around, because you, Dev, doesn't know what these things are going to do with the messages they receive. You, Dev, just tells everyone all, all the information because they ask for it. They, doesn't, they don't know, you, Dev, doesn't know which thing needs it first. Uh, so that wouldn't quite work. Uh, so what, what obviously you could do now is to say, okay, when Network Manager receives an, a, a request about the device it doesn't know about yet, it should say, well, probably I'm going to be told about it soon. So it just waits around, remembering the request until it's told about it from UDEV, and then it can carry on, carry on. Now, what I'm trying to get to here is that the problem of uh, ordering is something that in most cases, it just works fine because you don't have things racing each other, so you don't have to worry about it. But sometimes it might matter, and most probably as a developer, you will not be aware of it until it hits you, and then you will have to figure it out a lot. And this is really subtle and it's really uh, difficult to deal with usually. 
Um, right, so there are many ways of solving this. And uh, one thing that we will, well, uh, usually there's a trade-off. So if you solve the problem for ordering, you risk, very, uh, usually you end up by sacrificing scalability. So if you say that only one thing can ever happen at once, then obviously the ordering is sort of trivial, right? Because it's not, yeah, you're for, if, you, if your system enforces that only one message can be sent, once it's received, the other one can be sent, and so on, ordering is not that hard. Um, but of course that means that you don't scale, right? Uh, if only one message can be sent at a time on your system, it's going to be not very nice. Um, so this is a problem that needs solving. And we get back to that later. So with these problems in mind, what we talked about now, you can see that the appeal of using off-the-shelf uh, IPC systems rather than doing your homegrown thing might be more apparent. So there are sort of subtle problems that you probably don't want to deal with that an off-the-shelf solution will solve for you. And Dbus is trying to solve all these problems, uh, succeeds more or less uh, all of the, most of the time, um, and it's trying to make it sort of easy to use. I'm saying sort of easy because it's still not entirely trivial, but I think it's a lot easier than trying to figure out all of these things yourself uh, all the time. Exactly, and Divas tries, of course, uh, to solve this because it is, um, tries to be an IPC system that can be generally used on a system with many different servers in parallel. Um, uh, <laughs> Exactly, so the uh, question again, of course, becomes, uh, so if uh, Diva solves all that, sorry. All oh, right. <laughs> this could end badly. <laughs> um, exactly, so um, in Dbus, um, it tries to solve exactly that system, um, but the thing about Dbus is it en enforces the IPC system used by all those things. So uh, in the example Tom showed, we have three different IPC systems here. As he said, like an audio manager or, or a virtual machine manager or a network manager, and they can all use their own IPC. If you now look at, at Dbus and um, how Dbus tries to solve this uh, issue, um, we go back to the first example. Um, the thing Dbus does, Dbus adds a Dbus daemon. This is the system, and what Dbus tries to do is tries to enforce the ordering model and all that we had um, via this central daemon. And what that means is all the applications on your system that want to benefit from it have to use that Dbus daemon, and that means they have to route all the messages through it, which basically makes this picture. <laughs> it's my fault. Oh. Well, it's fine. Can you move one picture, Phil? No. <laughs> David will now do a little dance. <laughs> I think that happens if you happens if you run rawhide. Yeah. <laughs> Don't use rawhide, people. Um. Okay, I will just continue and show you the picture afterwards. Um, so the thing is, uh, Dbus tries to solve exactly that by having the central Dbus daemon and making everyone who use the same IPC and route all messages uh, through Dbus daemon. You need Better. power? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, um, uh, and that gives you the, the ordering guarantees and the composability that we're talking about before. Um, so that means, even uh, like Dbus solves two things, the one-to-one the -one communication problem that we had uh, described before, like identity or uh, uh, lifetime management of your objects or having uh, asynchronous method calls, um, but as well supports the composability of your system. So if you have many, th uh, sy uh, many uh, uh, IP, uh, uh, applications using different communications, but all over Dbus, they will all be composable. So all the properties we had will still hold uh, in that system where you have the distributed uh, uh, architecture. Can you, um, when he gets connected, can you start over where he left off and we'll just cut the video? We can do that as well. He didn't tell us we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the crowd here is patient, then I think it'll work out better for the video if we... Uh... Right. Can I read you some jokes as well? <laughs> I'm sure you have good Norwegian jokes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably about fish. 
Vikings. <laughs> I thought I thought like your system could boot in like two seconds now. Well, no, no, wrong account. Of course, of course. <laughs> he doesn't know how to be reverted, so stuck with it forever. Now we can invisible. Okay. Right. Looks good. Stop. Yeah. Oh, okay. Stop. Yeah. There. Exactly. So uh, we are back. Back to the previous picture. So we look again at the system where we said, uh, that Tom described earlier, that where we have the different applications using different IPC systems on your machine. And Tom described how the composability breaks um, if those IPC systems do not take care of that. Um, and the way Dbus tries to solve that is by introducing a new uh, Dbus daemon and making everybody who wants to uh, benefit from the uh, things Dbus provides use the Dbus daemon. Um, and this requires all those different IPC systems to become the same. So they can't use their own thing, but they have to use Dbus. And additionally, they have to route all their messages through Dbus daemon, um, which then makes that picture become that. So we now see all of those same colors, so you use the same IPC systems. But all the clients can't talk to their daemons anymore directly, but they have to talk to uh, Dbus daemon, which then forwards the messages correctly. Of course, in that picture, obviously, ordering is now a given because we have a single point here where every message goes through. So the ordering of messages, of course, given. Um, so yeah, uh, if you look at that, we solved all the issues we have uh, above, so we should be good to go. Well, obviously, this is not really what you want on your system because, okay, it's maybe uh, badly drawn here, but you don't want everything to route through one diverse daemon, but you want what you had before and you want uh, each IPC system to be able to choose whatever they want if they have reasons not to use Dbus. Um, but at the same time, you want to make Dbus to provide a, a very generic way that suits as many uh, use cases as possible. Um, so one of the problems of this, uh, if you run Dbus daemon like this, obviously you have the scalability problem here because you have a single point. So every message needs to go through that single point. Now look at bigger machines where you have thousands of CPUs, uh, tens of thousands of CPUs on that system. If now only just few applications want to communicate with each other, but separately, like for instance, only those few uh, 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 peers want to talk and those peers and those peers, all of them have to wait on that one CPU that just executes uh, uh, Dbus daemon even though they probably never talk to each other. Um, so the only way to get that in Dbus is to explicitly separate all of them. So you say they can't talk to each other and then you provide a Dbus daemon for each. But that of course is uh, hard to manage because you don't want your system to be fine-grained managed by your administrator, but you want it to be automatic. Um, and at the same time, another issue that we talked uh, uh, before is the identity and lifetime management of objects. In Dbus, you always talk about peers, but what you want to talk about is objects on your peers. As we said before, we want to talk about network interfaces. We want to talk about images uh, of uh, disk images or virtual machines or whatever you have. Um, and Dbus does not give a first class object that represents those, um, but leaves that to applications to actually manage the lifetime. Um, and the identity of your objects. Right, so what we decided to do then um, uh, was that uh, we introduced a new kernel primitive in order to try to find a better way of making building IPC systems. So we have a new kernel primitive that you can use to build IPC systems from. So we were not trying to introduce a competitor or an alternative to Dbus, but rather uh, an IPC system usually comes, you know, it's built in, in two layers at least, so we have the transport layer, which is Unix domain sockets, so maybe TCP, 
uh, or our alternative, which we are introducing, bus one. And on top of that, we have the protocol layer, which could be X or Wayland or Dbus or something else. So we are not uh, looking necessarily to uh, replace the protocol layer, but we are looking to find, uh, to provide a new transport layer which solves the problem of compatibility. So what we want is to, to say, okay, if you want to use Dbus, use Dbus. If you want to use Wayland, use Wayland. If you want these things to talk to each other, that's fine. If you build your system on top of bus one, then you can go back to uh, where we were, what we wanted. So now, as long as the, the, all these things use the same protocol, they can use, sorry, the same transport, bus one, they can have whatever protocol they want. And what we provide them is a, the, uh, a global order and a, a guarantee that messages are delivered in the same order as if they were all routed to a central daemon, but without the scalability problems. So there, are, there is no central component, there's no shared variables, there's nothing that these clients have in common, and let, uh, um, unless, except for the time that they actually communicate. So when two peers communicate on, the, uh, on the, our system, they will, of course, uh, share data, but apart from that, they have nothing in common and they don't affect each other at all. So if you have thousands of CPUs and you have peers, you have two peers running on two CPUs and two peers on two different CPUs, and they don't communicate in any way, they're completely independent, as if they had been running on completely separate buses. But if they do communicate, they still have the ordering guarantees that Dbus would have given you. So that was, that's basically the, the, the thing that Bus1 wants to provide. On top of that, we want to uh, solve the problem of lifetime and identity issues. So ideally what you would want is not only that uh, each client on your bus, or each application rather, on your bus speaks independently of each other, but you would maybe want to f divide things up even more finely grained. So you want to have that each object in your application has a separate communication channel to use to each other object on, on your system. So we allow that. So in one application, you could have as many uh, communications channels as you want, basically as if you had several, many socket pairs, one for each object in your application, but still uh, providing the ordering guarantees that we, that we want. Uh, so um, with these two things in mind, we, we, solve the, we want to solve the issue of object identity and lifetime, and the issue of ordering without sacrificing scalability. Um, and based on that, um, we wish to explore the possibility of building uh, a Dbus uh, alternative on top of Bus1, which is uh, a drop-in, would be potentially a drop-in replacement for Dbus, uh, giving exactly the same semantics of as you as a programmer can still program against it without knowing the difference, but would still be allow, uh, in the common case, to avoid scalability problems and making things distributed under the hood. Uh, that's one aim that we want to that we're working towards. Another one is just to provide a primitive so that people can build other things on top of it. Uh, for instance, things like Wayland and Pulse Audio and whatever else people are, are using for different protocols for today. And then you would have the benefit that all of the things running on your system uh, could speak to each other and have the ordering guarantees as long as they use bus one under the hood. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, it would be even more interesting for people to try to introduce new protocols uh, using the primitives uh, of bus one and taking it to, to the extreme and using all the um, capability system that we haven't talked about, but that we think uh, it would be really valuable in the future. So that was basically what we wanted to say. If you have any questions, um, please yeah, go ahead. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so, uh, so the current state is the kernel module, which provides the transport layer that we play, like, is an alternative to Unix domain sockets, um, is finished and works. And yeah, we've been using it and testing it and does its job. It's not merged upstream, and we don't have a real uh, use, uh, user right now that is ready uh, to use in user space. Uh, which is what we are working on. So we are currently porting Dbus um, over to use bus one as a transport. And so it can, so you can actually use, in the picture we had before, uh, you can use in one part Dbus and everybody else can use other, for instance, Wayland on bus one and they would get the order guarantee. So we make sure that Dbus actually adheres to those. And uh, so if others also use bus one as a transport, it would just work. Um, that's what we are currently working on. And yeah. So once we, once we have some software and user space actually using it, then we will try to actually uh, 
submitted for inclusion upstream because we didn't want to try to push uh, bus one upstream before we have a real uh, a practical uh, user of it. So that's what we are. That's where we are. The whole bus is basically done. So you, if people want to play with it, uh, there's a GitHub repository. You can clone it and uh, go wild. So I think we had the bus one module ready back then already. Um, what we worked on since then is um, if we want to support DBus on bus one, we need to always make sure that we are backwards compatible. Um, so what we did since then is to write a the backwards compatible parts which we have ready right now. So we can boot our system with, a, um, with DBus, but without DBus daemon on it, just, provide, just via the backwards compatible channels that we have. The thing missing right now is to have the new features underneath those we haven't tested yet and um, implemented yet. Um, so we wanted to first make sure that everything that does not speak bus one natively, which is everything right now, uh, still works. And now we introduce bus one um, as a transport to it and start putting other uh, 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 DBus libraries to bus one so we can actually test them natively. And that backwards compatibility daemon we finished three days ago, four days ago, something like that, yep. and can now successfully boot with it. And yeah, now the I next think step. maybe also since then we, uh, I don't remember exactly when the timeline here, but we have, uh, we, we submitted an RFC to LKML uh, for bus one, got some feedback, went to the kernel summit, presented it there and got some more feedback, and so we had done some changes since then to, to address that feedback, but that's all basically done, so we just need to, to do another round of RFCs uh, at some point. Okay. And the second question was, um, if this possible to get some more updates of what you think about integrating bus one with, with Wayland, yeah. um, because I think we have some kind of use case for that, uh, which is, right now it's not possible from some application to capture the full screen So the, the advantage that bus one would give, like Wayland already uses a pro, okay, the question is um, um, how Wayland could uh, uh, benefit from using bus one as a transport in particular, whether you could get like a screen capture running where you don't have to talk to each application individually, but you somehow get the entire screen out of it. Um, so Wayland already has a similar architecture to most other uh, normal IPC uh, uh, systems you ha uh, have on your system running. So you have one daemon running, which is a Unix domain socket listener, and clients connect to it and talk to it over that channel, multiplexing all the commands uh, via that channel. But on Wayland, each such connection between the daemon and one client is a perfectly private one, so they don't share any objects they talk about with other applications. So whenever an application creates windows or operates on windows, draws windows, destroys windows, moves windows, reads windows, um, it can only operate on its own windows um, because the ID namespace is private for each connection. Um, so whenever it wants to talk or capture or read a uh, uh, an, uh, window of another application, they, the, the namespace will not provide those. So, you need some extension in the, the Wayland protocol that allows you to map those windows or the, those window IDs or surface IDs. Um, that, like you could do that on Unix domain circuits, um, of course, with the current Wayland protocol. The advantage with uh, Pass one would be you could get direct connections to other clients without routing through the Wayland compositor. So right now, whenever you have a request, you talk to the Wayland compositor and that one can forward it to somebody else or, and route it back. But in bus one, you could actually, if you, for instance, are a privileged client, get a direct handle to a window of somebody else, and you can directly talk to that one without ever sending a message through uh, the Wayland compositor. Um, and this would uh, effectively uh, 
reduce the, the, the round trips you have to run through uh, to get you know, direct connections to other clients. Uh, one of the examples where you can use that is if you have an on-screen keyboard, which is sometimes, or you want to be integrated with your applications because you want to print on your input line, uh, 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 where you, yeah, your input buffer, you want to print some hints. Um, another client draws them because it's the input method and your application draws the window. So you want whatever they have drawn on your window and that one uh, to the compositor. In that case, um, right now it's always routed through the Wayland compositor, but with plus one you would get the direct channel. But it doesn't solve protocol uh, issues. Like you still would need to define the Wayland protocol uh, to do that. Exactly, yes. And for each object you have, which Wayland already has, like its first level, of, uh, uh, first class objects, they have actual IDs for server side and client side objects. You always talk uh, about objects. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, when you said you create a screen capture with using these uh, protocols, which uh, uh, basically makes use of the address spaces or the memories which can see uh, through the bus one. So does that make use of the remote procedure calls to access those uh, applications? Or? So the question is whether you get um, direct memory access to yeah. the other address spaces um, of other applications. Uh, no, bus one does not give you direct access. Whenever you communicate over bus one, similar to Unix domain sockets or pipes, you send a message. The difference is that we support single copy, that is your actual message is just copied once directly into the receive buffer of the other application. Um, and the reason why we do that, why we don't do uh, zero copy, is simply that copying things is actually faster than doing uh, the zero copy part. Um, because for the zero copy part, you need to actually map the right pages into the other application and unmap them um, on like either the send or after you're done. And those are much slower than just copying a message in most cases. Um, but what you can always do is, of course, transmit file descriptors, which you can map in both applications, but then you're responsible to take care of access uh, rights and so on. Okay. okay. As far as performance goes, uh, what is there a performance issue here? Or? So the, we actually succeeded in making bus one scale uh, linearly with the number of CPUs you add if you only consider bus one. So there's not a single variable, not a single cache line shared between different bus one uh, clients. There's no way they can affect each other on the system regarding bus one, except if they want to. Um, so this is the first primitive on Linux we're aware of that does uh, allow uh, intercommunication uh, without uh, having to sacrifice scalability, and that works. Um, regarding raw performance, so just sending one message to another one, um, as soon as a message is big enough, we outperform all the other uh, uh, primitives right now. Um, big enough means roughly 64 kilobyte. As long as you're below 64 kilobytes, Bus one has bigger overhead right now as Unix domain sockets, but this is roughly in the scale of, so on our machines, a single message on Unix domain sockets takes between 500 and 1000 nanoseconds. And with bus one, it is between 900 and 1200. So we are most, most times we are between 1.5 and 2.0 uh, times slower, but um, only for yeah, small messages that are below that threshold. And that's basically because Unix domain sockets really are optimized for one-to-one -one communication. And in bus one, we actually allow one-to-many communication. So we need at least to make a lookup to find a destination. And those that can be seen in us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>